Hi, this is Jens again, and this is part two of my series about the electric chair and me, the three years I spent under direct threat of the death penalty in the late 1980s, from June 13th, 1986 till July 9, 1989. In this video, I want to talk about what it felt like. In the first video, I talked about the legal maneuvers and all that. This is going to be more about my feelings. I guess I should start with June the 9th, 1986, the day after I gave my false confession, when my lawyer told me, you've just committed suicide, you've killed yourself. You know, I told you not to talk. That's what my lawyer said to me. I told you not to talk, and you did it anyway, and you gave them a confession to double murder, and you don't have diplomatic immunity. You don't even have a limited form of diplomatic immunity which is what I thought I had, where I got transferred to Germany for trial. You've got none of that. You're going to die in the electric chair because you couldn't keep your mouth shut. That's what my lawyer essentially said to me. He didn't say it like that. But that's, what, that's the message I got. The message I got was, I'm going to die because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And that's what I had to live with. You know, It's all my fault. And the lesson I learned from all that is don't talk. No matter what else happens now, don't say a damn thing. And then, just like my lawyer predicted, five days later, on June the 13th, 1986, the prosecutor in Virginia, the Commonwealth's attorney, indicted me for capital murder. And what you have to understand is the way the legal system works, once they indict you, right, they stop investigating. At that point, the prosecutor has made his decision who's guilty, and then the whole thing revolves only around ensuring that a conviction happens. It's no, it's no longer about finding out the truth. And at my trial in 1990, one of my attorneys asked the lead investigator at that time, Ricky Gardner, whether they did any further investigation after June the 13th, 1986. And he said, no. Yeah, that's when they decided who did it. And after that was only about proving me guilty and convicting me and if at all possible, executing me. And what you have to understand is that for me, this wasn't just about dying a horrible death in the electric chair. It was about dying for Elizabeth Hasten. Because in my mind, you know, I thought I was saving her life with this false confession. I believed I believed I was the hero of this sad story. And even after I got indicted for capital murder, you know, I had originally planned to give a false confession under the belief that I had a limited form of diplomatic immunity and that that would mean I only got 10 years in a German juvenile prison and that would save her life from execution. And that turned out not to be true. Now I was going to die, but that just meant that my sacrifice was greater. In a twisted sort of way, I was proud of that because my sacrifice would be even greater. I was even more the hero of this whole story. You know, it's pretty heroic to sacrifice 10 years of freedom to save your girlfriend's life. But if you're sacrificing your life to save your girlfriend's life, you know, on, on some level, on some crazy level, you're an even greater hero because at this stage, you know, I still loved her. I still loved her. This is, we're talking about mid-June 1986. And I didn't want her to die. I loved her. And if that meant I had to die, I wasn't okay with that. I wasn't happy. But on some level, I could sort of live with it and be a little proud of it. And then there came these various legal maneuvers to try to save my life. And the first one was, I talked about these in the first video. The first one of these was that these psychiatrists examined Elizabeth and me to see whether the charges could be reduced prior to our extradition from murder to manslaughter by reason of diminished capacity. And so they met with Elizabeth and they met with me, and I had to tell the whole story again. But mostly they were interested in the relationship between us. As part of their examinations, they would sometimes ask questions like, so um, Mr. Zuring, you, you really believe that, huh? And I guess those questions became more and more, right? And they kind of planted a doubt in my mind that grew. And I remember sometime in the fall of 1986, I think it was. Yeah, I mean, late summer, 
fall of 1986, somewhere in there, I had a meeting with one of these psychiatrists. Her name was Dr. Henrietta Bullard. And we met these examinations, but you know, they, they took place in the prison hospital. So they would take me from the cells and take me to the prison hospital. And it was, you know, bars on the window and the whole place smelled like disinfectant hospital smell. And we were in there and she was talking to me. And I remember for the first time, I began to realize that most of what Elizabeth had told me was actually not true. It was actually lies. And I remember crying <laughs> so much. I really, I, God, I bawled. I just couldn't stop crying. But it wasn't like the scales fell from my eyes and suddenly I realized the truth. It wasn't like that. It was a process. The relationship with Elizabeth had lasted, you know, maybe 15 months. And I would say it took at least 15 months to kind of completely come back out of that. It was a process. And it's not like from one day to the next, it was over and I was, you know, ha, could see the truth. It, it took time. It took, it took a lot of time. It took months and over a year. And the psychiatrist told me that Elizabeth was really ill. Back then it was called borderline psychosis. Later on, the name got changed. You know, this is late 1980s, it's long ago. They called it borderline psychosis. Today, they call it borderline personality disorder. And they said that I had something called folie à deux, which is French, it means craziness with two. Fully craziness à deux with two. And there's another modern term for it. It's like, I think it's induced psychotic disorder or something. So it's a, it's a recognized thing. What it basically means is you've got one person who's very ill. They said borderline psychosis. And that illness is kind of like transferred to another person, and that would be me. And once the people are separated, it kind of starts going away. That's what happened with me over the months, you know, this influence that I was under got less and less and less. I was no longer under this induced psychotic disorder fully I do. And I, I could see the world again the way I think most people would see it. But because the psychiatrist told me that she was very ill, I started feeling compassion for her. I no longer loved her, or not very much. I, still, I think I still loved her a little bit, but that reduced a lot. This is in the fall of 1986. The love definitely grew less, but I, instead of that, I felt compassion with her because the psychiatrist told me that she was, you know, really seriously mentally ill. So I, I didn't hate her or anything, but of course it was really, really, really hard because, you know, I was under threat of the death penalty and I realized I was not sacrificing my life for love. I was sacrificing my life for a bunch of lies told to me by a very sick woman. So I wasn't the hero anymore. I was the idiot. I was the idiot who was going to die, not for love, but for a bunch of lies, for a crazy person. But it got worse. <laughs> it got worse. So 86 turned into 87. And Elizabeth, who was not under the threat of the death penalty, voluntarily returned to the United States. She, they call it waiving extradition. So she went back, which was tactically and strategically the correct move because she was able to return over there and tell her story first and her version of events. Smart move, legally. And she went over there and in order to improve her negotiating position, you know, she told just... <laughs> the craziest stories to make yourself look like the victim and to make me look like a monster. She told the police that um, I wanted to kill my grandmother. She said that I wanted to kill one of the police officers, Ricky Gardner, and she saved his life by stopping me from killing him. She said that I tortured her cat. She said that I was impotent until the night of her parents' funeral and then I raped her. Kind of strange because she didn't mention that in any of the letters she wrote me. So, but nevertheless, that's what she told the cops because she wanted to be, you know, poor little me and he's the bad guy. And this was to some extent effective. She pleaded guilty as an accessory before the fact, instigating the whole thing. And they accepted that. And then she had a sentencing hearing. At the sentencing hearing, she again did everything in her power to say that she was more or less my victim, you know. I forced her into all this, and it was all my idea, and she just kind of went along with it. 
that was the story she told in the fall of 1987. Everything was my fault. And interesting, her own brother and her mother's best friend testified at the sentencing hearing. And they said that they did not believe the theory of the prosecution that she was the instigator and I was the actual killer. They said that they believed she was at the crime scene. But then the judge stopped them from saying anything more. And that's in the transcript. So I'm not the only one saying this. Her own brother and her mother's best friend think that what she told the court was, as they say, a bunch of hooey. But for me, what this did is a year earlier, in the fall of 1986, I had to face this realization that I would be executed, that I would die, not for love, but for a bunch of lies that a very sick woman told me. And now, a year later, in the fall of 1987, I had to realize that she was not just a mentally ill person, but she was actually pretty evil because she did everything in her power to make me look as bad as possible and you know, downright monstrous, and herself as this total little victim, which was just not true, okay? So again, this was a process you know, where I had to understand that I was gonna die for somebody who hated me, for somebody who despised me, and for somebody who was trying everything in her power basically to help the prosecutor and the police put me in the electric chair through her testimony at her own sentencing hearing. That's pretty hard when you're sitting in a jail cell to realize you're gonna die for somebody who despises and hates you. That's what you're giving your life for. So to describe what that was like, for most of the time when I was waiting for extradition in England, I was in Her Majesty's Prison Brixton. That's how they call prisons over there. In America, they usually call them correctional centers. In Britain, they call them HMP, Her Majesty's Prison. I was in HMP Brixton. Back then, that was what Americans call a jail and what Brits call a remand center, <sighs> pre-trial prison, people waiting on trial. It was built, I think, in 1847. So even at the time I was there, it was you know, roughly 150 years old. Basically just a stone room, 11 by 7. 11 feet long, 7 feet wide, roughly. Just stone, room. No toilet, no sink, no nothing. Uh, what you got was you got a plastic bucket with a lid, if you got lucky. Not all buckets had lids, but most buckets had lids. And you got to empty that bucket twice a day. And that's what you urinated and defecated into. And you had a bed, and a little table, and a little chair, and a little locker. And you had a plastic cup and a mug with water so you could have something to drink. And we were locked up for 22 hours a day in there. Wow, and then you talk about the smell. <laughs> Let me tell you about that. This prison was, you know, roughly 150 years old, no plumbing. So for 150 years, people had you know, prisoners had urinated and defecated into buckets in the corner. And of course, the place stank. It just smelled outrageously bad. For 150 years, that, you know, the walls, the paint had soaked that stuff up. And I was there in a special unit, the high security unit, because I was under threat of the death penalty. That's why they put me in there. I was the only one, of course, because Britain at that point technically still had the death penalty, but it wasn't sentencing anybody to the death penalty anymore. But because I was under threat of the death penalty, they put me into this unit called Cat A with terrorists and organized crime. And, you know, for two hours a day, we could leave ourselves and, you know, talk. And the funny thing is I actually developed, I wouldn't say friendship, but there was a couple of guys I could talk with, you know, on a sort of more or less human level. And they were, ba they were both terrorists. <laughs> Pretty, pretty bad terrorists too. <laughs> but on a human level, at least, I could sort of talk to them a little bit. And because I had to live with this death penalty hanging over me, I needed to talk to somebody. And, and in a way, I was lucky that I was, could at least talk to a couple of prisoners there. Because most of the day I was locked up, you know, 22 hours a day in this room. And we didn't have TV, but we could have a little radio. Only AM, not FM. <laughs> And I could read books and newspapers, 
And every few months, my lawyers would send me, you know, the latest appeals that they sent into the courts. And in these appeals, there were these very lengthy descriptions of what an execution in the electric chair looks like and feels like. And I told you about that in part one of this. Yeah, I read that over and over and over again for three years. How would I die? Because that was my future, you know. That's the way I would die. And I had really nothing else to read, so I spent a lot of time with that. And then when, you know, those two hours a day when I could actually go around and talk to other people, it was this, you know, this expression that they had back then. I don't know whether they still use it. People who've been sentenced to death, they call them dead men walking. And of course, that's what I was. You know, my lawyers have told me, we can file these appeals, but they're hopeless. You will, we cannot help you, really. We can just extend your life a little bit in prison. But we can't stop this execution. So you're going to die in the electric chair. And I believe this. I believe this, you know. So I felt like a dead man walking. And, you know, it's like you're already gone, but you're still walking around and you, you feel a bit like a ghost. You get treated that way, too, by other people, guards and the prisoners. They you kind of, they didn't, they, you know, they stood back a little bit because, you know, they all faced what they considered to be long sentences. And in England at that time, a long prison sentence was 15 to 18 years. But nobody else faced the death penalty. So they, in a weird sort of way, that gave me a little bit of protection. This whole time... Again, I was not just waiting on my own death. I had to deal with the knowledge that the person that I would be dying for hated and despised me based on what she said in court. So to deal with these emotions, I had to talk to somebody. And I was really fortunate that there was a German diplomat working at the embassy in London at the time, a wonderful lady, Weitaut Sefte. She's long since deceased, but she visited me every week and talk to me so that I'd have somebody to talk to. And she was a great, she was a vice consul at the embassy. She was a great person. And uh, that gave me a lot of comfort and kept me in touch with my emotions and stuff like that. And my parents visited me repeatedly, it was fantastic. And my brother visited me, even my grandmother visited me. She was a tough lady. I liked my grandmother. Uh, nobody else did. <laughs> she visited me and she told me a real gentleman would take his own life to spare his family the embarrassment. Looking back, I think she was right. <laughs> I think she was right. I think overall I should have done that, but I didn't. Another mistake. So how did I deal with this emotionally? Nowadays, I work as a public speaker in the area of resilience, mental strength. And uh, one of the things that I talk about is the principle of acceptance. And the idea that you have to accept the facts, but you should not accept the conclusions drawn from those facts. Okay? What do I mean by that? I had to accept that I was indicted for capital murder and that the state of Virginia wanted to kill me. But that did not necessarily mean that the state of Virginia would get to do that. As long, that's a conclusion. That's a conclusion based on the facts. And I did not have to accept that. I thought about this long and hard. I had a lot of time. I knew I would have to die, but I did not have to die in the electric chair. That's something I could take away from my enemies in Virginia. They wanted to kill me, but I could stop them from doing that by taking my own life. That was the last victory I could win. I could take my own life so that they would not have the pleasure of killing me. That was really, really important to me. And I think it helped to keep me sane because I did not just passively accept my fate. I took my fate into my own hands even then while under threat of the death penalty. So I got hold of a bed sheet, made it into a rope, and I tore some other sheets up as well and I had a plan. Uh, this was a Ramon prison back then, a jail, what Americans call a jail. 
and the bed was not welded to the floor. I planned on flipping it up on its end and attaching it to the bars of the window. And then there was a bar there. And I planned on hanging myself from that, taking my own life, so that I would deny my enemies the pleasure of killing me. I had to do that in England before my extradition because I knew that once I was in America, in Virginia, I would be watched around the clock. They, usually, they always do that with people on death row. They watch them around the clock so that they don't take their own life because the state wants to kill you. They don't, they, you know, this is not just my idea. Other people have had this idea. And that's why they watch people on death row really closely so that they don't take their own life. So I knew that when the European court made its decision, made its ruling, I would have about a week at most, right? before they came and got me and took me to America, and I would have to basically kill myself right, right away if I wanted to win this last and final victory. God, I was focused on that. Ha! Oh, that gave me a lot of strength. That gave me a lot of strength. I think it stopped me from going crazy. This idea that I would not take it lying down. I would have the last word. I would have the final victory, even if it cost me my own life. Then came the surprising, <laughs> the surprising ruling by the European Court of Human Rights that they would not send me back unless America dropped the death penalty charges. Nobody expected that. We were all shocked. So I threw my rope away. <laughs> and then I was sent back to America and I was sentenced to two life sentences. And of course, in the United States, life means life. You stay in prison until you die. And I did not just get one life sentence, I got two life sentences. So I was definitely staying until I died. And I spent, you know, another 30 years in prison. And I found out that life without parole, life means life. That's actually worse than execution. It's a worse punishment. My friends always get angry when I say this, what I'm about to say. But looking back over my life and those horrible decades, decades in prison, I think, I think it would have probably been better if I died back then. Yeah. Either from hanging myself or from being executed. I think it would probably have been better. Because um, the next 30 years were so bad. They were so awful. They were so awful. So, there's something worse than death. <laughs> and that's the story of me and the electric chair.